Welcome to the Beverly Hills Plastic Surgery Podcast. I'm Dr. Jay Calvert. Today, I am here in the office with the most excellent and very, very sort of tired and frustrated <laughs> with the pre-op process, <laughs> Dr. Millicent Ravello. That is me. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Isn't the pre-op process painful? The pre-op process is so necessary and mildly painful for everyone involved. It is. It's there painful is for the so patients. There is so much paperwork oh and the poor things are sitting there like reading every single line about this could go wrong and then this could go wrong and then this could happen and then your legs could fall off you know like <laughs> that's basically signing your life away with these pre-op paperworks i know and but you, you gotta know, you do, have it. To do it and it just takes yeah. forever it takes forever it's a lot but you know it is what it is that's how we do surgery yep that's it you know and, and it's interesting just to digress for a minute from our topic which is mid-face lift uh technical aspects which we will get to, I promise you. Uh, the those consents are really like overbearing. There are so much information in them. When I finally, I like to actually kind of see them before they do all the paperwork, because I'm like, okay, these are the four complications I'm actually concerned about for this right. operation, and everything else, don't even read about it. Don't worry about it. Like that is not even probably going to happen. I've never even heard of that happening. Right. These are the four things I'm actually concerned about. That's what you need to know. And that's but, the truth. And then every year, like a new consent gets added that they have to do. Like last year, we had to add on like special breast implant consents. And then this year, we had to add on special dermal mesh consents. And then the following year, we had to add on like COVID consents. Like the list just keeps growing. And it's just, it's helpful information for the patient, but it's a lot of also just CYA, which is frustrating. Yeah, I mean, that's true. I don't sit there and say like, by the way, if you somehow sneakily have COVID-19 <laughs> while you're going into surgery, there's a chance that your lungs could explode and you're going to wind up on a ventilator or an ECMO for six months and then probably die. Yeah. Like, I don't say that because the odds are, since we're COVID testing any, everybody, that's not going to happen. It's not something you go in worrying about. But you got to sign a consent for it. You sure do. <laughs> it says there, I could wind up on ECMO. I could wind up in the ICU. Lightning could strike me while I was rolling into the operating room. I mean... Yeah, those things can happen, but typically when you're having surgery, there are like three or four things you need to know that are known sort of common issues that you need to yeah. deal with. I don't even know that they're like complications, but they, they are because they complicate the surgery and make right. it less of a path to the healing that you're looking for, but they're things we deal with all the time and we take care of that. Agreed. So that's what I was doing today. I was waiting through the pre-op process. I know. I, my patients. I saw you with a javelin missile thrower, <laughs> like getting ready to launch that thing into the waiting room. So it's okay. But I'm here now and it's all good. <laughs> well, then let's talk about mid-face lifts because we, we've done a podcast about mid-face We lift. have. We've done a podcast. We've talked about it on several other podcasts. Um, it's something that we really like doing. Um, we're big fans of it. So we wanted to get into some of the actual technicalities of it and when it's used, who it's used for, and what other surgeries can it be combined with. Yeah. And, and that's the thing. I mean, you were gracious enough to share your experience, but I, you know, I was doing two mid face lifts this week, as a matter of fact. And I was like, and they were two totally different. One patient was 37 or 38 years old. One of them was 64 years old. And, and so the, the reasons for them were completely different. Right. And the way that I accomplished the mid face lift was completely different. Totally different indications, totally different patients. Right. So the, the bottom line, a mid face lift, just to define it is when the, you're basically, it's a cheek lift. It's the cheek and it's the, the skin that's to the side of the eye. And then usually you combine it with a lateral brow lift. But it's this cheek mass that you're trying to lift. And it does a couple of things. I, I like to use it to support my lower eyelid surgery, which yeah. is really handy. When you do the lower lid blepharoplasty and then lift the cheek, it really shortens the mm -hmm. lid and it gets rid of the bag. I need one myself. I got it. But, the, uh, but that's the, the real winner in terms of the aesthetics is it makes your lower eyelids much more useful Look way better i mean i find it almost hard to do an isolated lower lid blepharoplasty without a mid face right because i'm just like oh but it'd be so much better with the mid face yeah it be just it's so much better because the two are really connected you know totally. and trying to separate them into two separate parts you're only going to partially improve that area if you just do one as opposed to both the areas it is they are two separate anatomic areas but they are very much a part of the same 
you know, visual, cosmetic, aesthetic area. Right. It's it's this unit that you're talking about. And when that lower lid comes up, and if you if you release the ligament, so the, the way that I like to do it is I like to go through the inside of the eyelid and through a transconjunctival approach, go down to the orbital rim, which is the bone, this bone under the uh, basically under your eyeball and release that ligament and let the fat sort of drape out into the tear trough and then lift that cheek so that the, the tear trough kind of comes up and it smooths it and it looks very it. youthful. And, it's, and that ligament that we keep talking about is the junction between the lower lid and the cheek. Right. Um, it's a very known structure and it over time is what causes people to have what they call dark circles, hollowing under their eyes, bags. It's because that junction between the lower lid and the cheek is being tethered by this actual anatomic structure, this ligament. And I'm, I'm wearing them now. Yes, you are. I see that. I'm looking at them. <laughs> and the only way to smooth that totally. out and get rid of that right here, by the way. hollow, get rid of that fat bag is to obliterate that ligament so that the whole area can be smoothed and then lifted. Lifted Absolutely. is the idea. And so the lift that you have to get, so that's where the mid face comes in, where we make the incision up and and again I want to go back to like who gets it in a second but the way that I approach it is through a, a temporal incision I, I feel for the temporal crest here and I like to span the temporal crest which is this bone the temporal crest for people who are not looking at us right it's basically the side of your head yeah the <laughs> above well, your eyebrows where, in your scalp in your hair it's where your temp <laughs> temporalis muscle is which is when you chew you can feel it clench yeah. and then it's and then you can feel there's a ridge when you go up onto the skull you can feel it there but I like to span that temporal crest um, so that I can get down onto the temporalis muscle and go down to the zygoma because I, I release this whole... Zygoma is your cheekbone. Yeah, that for, for Tracy in Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to like make this easy to understand. You're like speaking big doctor words. I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's fancy. A, it's very fancy. Um, so the zygoma being the cheekbone, the cheek... The, it's really this lateral part in front of the ear. You know, your zygoma is a big bone with an arch, which is the side over here on your face, um, right in front of your ear. But then it's also the body of the zygoma is right under your, basically at the lateral part of your eye. So you're going to release, you're going to come down from up in the hair, on, through that incision, release subperiosteally over the bone of the frontal bone above your eyebrow, which is means you're under all the tissue. You are literally, you got your instruments on the bone and i mean it like you are there and you lift all that up you go down and uh for reals i am pointing the uh <laughs> then you're going to go down onto the zygoma which you're not going to get subperiosteal on the zygoma on the zygomatic arch but you're going to be just on top of the periosteum basically if you were to try to go periosteal you get behind the zygoma uh it's how we fix zygomatic arch fractures actually it's called the gillies approach for the uh, our uh, sports fans in the audience that are listening the and so then you lift everything up you get down over the masseter which is the muscle that you chew with on this underneath the zygomatic arch and this entire unit is mobile and it's awesome I have a great video from the other day it is like you can put that thing wherever you want to and then how you lift it depends on what you're trying to accomplish and how heavy the cheek is right so on Tuesday no on Monday the cheek was very heavy. And so I used an endotine device. And that is an absorbable device that gets into the mass. It has four prongs and then a, a little kind of uh, tail that pull, you can get it into the cheek mass. You lift and suture it to the temporalis fascia, the, the thick coating of the muscle up on the side of the head there. And that lifts the cheek like it's nobody's business and it holds it and it holds it there big time which is the big part big of that. time big time yeah it really holds it and i love it but in a thinner person you're going to feel it for the rest of the year <laughs> right <laughs> until it takes it a long time to absorb. <laughs> <laughs> and so you're gonna be like what are these points in my face what are these yeah. points in my face that's your endotine device when's it gonna go away in about mm -hmm. a year yeah it's gonna take a while it takes a while and once it goes away that's fine because it doesn't need to stay once no. you know the six months three months once that time frame has gone by your cheek is pretty much stuck there like it's sort of living in its new home and its new place and it's happy so it doesn't need the end of time to stay but it by takes a way, while for it to absorb you probably need it for like three days 
That's true. It sticks down <laughs> because pretty it quickly. Sticks right down. It's it does. Like, you know, like why do they even have to make it absorb and like use a different polymer, people? <laughs> Here's an idea for you, industry people. Feel free to steal it. Give me one that's gone in two weeks so I don't have to hear about it for the entire right. year. Because then you could use it on a thinner patient. Exactly. If I know it's going to be gone in two or three yeah. weeks, we're done. Perfect. I'll right. use it. So in the people that are thinner, then I do suture uh, fixation where I actually put the stitches into the periosteum that has been elevated. And I usually do three of those to elevate the cheek, elevate the lateral, uh, the skin and the soft tissue lateral to the uh, eye socket and then sum up on the temporalis fascia, and that does the job as well. But it's harder in heavier cheek people. That's why I like the end of time in, the, in folks that have like, you know, some serious mass in their cheek there. Right, and that's, so that's sort of the basics of the technique, and then the next sort of thing we have to discuss is who gets it and when, and with what other surgeries would you do it with? So in a younger patient, like myself, I had it done with the lower eyes and just the mid face because that was the area of concern. Um, but in someone else that's more in an actual facelift category, so they need the whole lower face, they need the neck, you're probably gonna do it in combination with a facelift. So that's where totally. the differences kind of come into play. Yeah, and it, it's great in combination, as we talked about with the lower lids, upper lids, whatever. Um, it is. It is a really powerful technique, and it does change the shape of your face. It does, for sure. It, it, it takes that bottom heavy face, elevates the cheek, gets some more heart shape, more oval to it, and I just, I love doing it. You know, I, I have an aunt who lives in Louisiana, and she's a very no-nonsense person. I don't think she would have ever in her whole aunts? life. I have, I have an aunt problem. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of ants. <laughs> I have a lot of ants. Um, but she's not into the world of cosmetic surgery, Botox, fillers. She doesn't really know anything about that. But after I had my mid face lift, she saw some photos and she asked my mom, she was like, I don't remember Mill's cheeks being that high. She had no <laughs> idea that I'd had a surgery or a procedure. She's the only person in my family that even noticed because I hadn't told them. And mom was like, oh, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> but she like called it. She was like, there's something different about her face. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it was pretty striking. I mean, I know that like uh, one of our nurses noticed it because she, she kind of like looked at you and she was like, Kind of like, I don't remember Dr. Millicent being that beautiful. <laughs> like, I was sort she of like a backhanded kind of ugly comment. before. I, mean. <laughs> just, I was like, <laughs> yeah, she was. Like, are you kidding? But, you know, it was not only because it did change the shape of your face. And it, 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 it's a big deal. I mean, people don't realize how impactful good aesthetic surgery is in terms of your overall look, your confidence. They just don't get it. Like the mental health... We, we need to do an entire podcast on the mental health aspects of plastic surgery, both good benefits and then sort of the trying times of, yes. of revision rhinoplasty <laughs> and, and yes. the, the hard times. <laughs> I think I need a Xanax before that podcast. <laughs> <laughs> totally. <laughs> I mean, the good times are good, but the, the bad times are, times are ugly, really bad. Yeah. They, they, I mean, it's hard to go through certain operations that we do and, Revision rhinoplasty is one that leaps to mind for me since I do so much of it, but I've gotten better about prepping people for that part. <laughs> anyway, back to the mid facelift. The, the, the reality of the multiple procedures is really about just making a good assessment of your patient. Right. Spending time really looking at what the issues are. I saw a patient today for a facelift and I said, you need the whole, you, you need the full Monty. You need lower face and neck. You need the mid face. You need the upper lower bluffs, the brow. Like everything, plus you know yeah. some ironing when we're done, and right. that's she needs like she lasers. Needs and she needs because everything. The face doesn't age in just one area. You know, the no. whole thing falls when it falls, um, and that's sometimes hard for patients to sort of wrap their mind and their pocketbook around. Like, well, I just came in for a facelift. Yeah, the pocketbook like, is a whole other. That's discussion. a whole other thing, and it's like I know you came in for a facelift, and you can have just a facelift, but if you really want to address everything that is, you know. Yeah going south literally then these are the things that you would also need to do in combination again so that you're not treating just one area but treating the face as a whole yeah and that's how you create facial harmony and that this was something that when i was coming up as a resident there was a guy named bill little from washington dc and he talked about it all the time about facial harmony and and he was he was really good about sort of teaching the aspects of aesthetic surgery that caused me as a, as a young resident to kind of look and say, boy, you really do have to kind of spend a lot of time, you know, 
knocking things and stretching and pulling and elevating and looking and and really try to make the best decisions for your patient because you don't want to do too much but you certainly don't want to do too little no that's true and i would say on average you know like we always say before befores and afters look at the befores and afters i had a patient today that came in and she was like my mom's friend had a facelift the other day and she looks really weird. She's got like her eyebrows up to her hairline, her cheeks are all puffy. And I'm like, well, that was somebody's look. So you sort of got to look and see, you know, what you're, you're going for. But ideally, yes, you treat the face as a whole, you harmonize it, you make it look great, but it's not cheap. No, and it is like, not cheap. No, the, my, the mid facelift ain't cheap. Uh, I don't like well, to quote prices because well, times change, so times we won't do change, that. Yeah. Give a call to the office if you want to hear some ranges and all that. But, but, but it's also different here than, than it is in Dallas. Than or, yeah. But still, I mean, if you're doing a lateral brow, which is a brow lift, and an upper blepharoplasty for the eyes, a lower blepharoplasty for the lower eyes, a mid face, and a lower face, that's five separate procedures. So if you think about dividing it into five separate procedures and imagining what the cost would be for each of those five procedures and then putting it all together, yeah, it's going to be a lot. So that is where you sort of have to be like, mm, kind of get ready for that. Yeah, I mean, especially in Beverly Hills. Our, our, our area of the country is an outlier. It's an anomaly. But New York's the same as we are. And in fact, I talked to... Uh, a consultant from New York, and she said the prices in New York are way higher than Beverly Hills. Like they've gone it's terrifying. through the roof. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, how could that possibly be? But we should, we should start advertising in New York. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, hey, you know. <laughs> get your discount surgery in Beverly Hills. <laughs> it's thirty percent cheaper in Beverly Hills. Come on out. It's still expensive, but that's the thing. I, and and I do say that we've said it on this podcast before, and I'm gonna say it now. There are plenty of great plastic surgeons all over Anywhere this country. You live. Yes. They are board certified. They've trained the big programs. They know how to do these operations. They don't cost what it costs to do it here. And you'll get a good operation and good and you'll get just look at the before and afters. Look at the before and afters. Because I mean, I have I have this one gal now that uh, she's she's in. She's like, you know, I got my rhinoplasty and I just hated it. And then afterwards I looked at the website and I realized like Oh, I should have known no. this is what I was getting. I kind of got what... I got exactly what he does. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but lot, that's the truth. It's not a bad rhinoplasty. That's just... She just doesn't like the look. That's right. And it's yeah. not a bad rhinoplasty. It's a it's a fine rhinoplasty, but it's it's not what she wanted. Yeah. It, it, you know, could it be cuter? Sure. It could be... It can be different. And, you know, and, and that's that's the thing is like you got to see those before and afters because that's what's on. That's, that's, that's what's what for dinner. Get. That's right. Yeah. If, you, if you go to Morton's for, for dinner... You know what you're getting Guess there. Guess what? You're getting steak. You're getting because that's what they serve there. You're that's like, the oh, where's my vegan grain bowl? That's right. Uh, you know, if you go to Earth Cafe, it's different, <laughs> it's you true. know, and you might see Toby McGuire as your barista. That's right. You never know. Uh, but that's the thing. You want to look at those before and afters for this mid face lift thing. I think it's a it's a home run for the people that need it. It's it does have some complications to it. You can get you know, nerve injuries that are very temporary. They, I, I've never had a permanent nerve injury from a mid facelift. I have had people have weakness of the eyebrow. That's pretty common. Um, I recently had somebody that had a little bit of weakness closing her eyes, but I, I did. That. Yeah, it was a little weak. I had that for like three to four weeks. Yeah, it didn't bother her a, a whole lot, but yeah. I noticed it. And she's yeah. like, yeah, you know, but it's getting better. And it did. It got better. They all, they, those things they always all get, get better. better. But, yeah. um, but you can have a little trouble with the incisions. I've, I've only had one infection of the incision and it was in a patient who was HIV positive. Not that that had anything to do with it. I might have, might not have, but it was a long time ago when the antiretrovirals were also sort of like a hard hit to your immune system right. and got staph infection in, a, in an incision. That's the only one I've seen. Otherwise, no infections, no seromas. Sometimes you get some bruising that's pretty awful, but generally not. How, how long did it take your bruising to clear? Maybe a week. I don't remember having a lot of bruising. Yeah, I don't remember that either. Yeah, and you I, went to work like right after yeah. you left here. I know it was, <laughs> it was fine, swollen. But other than that, the bruising wasn't bad. Yeah, that um, difficulty closing my eye was like three or four weeks. It was fine. Um, that's pretty did much. Did you like it. do tears or anything? Or? I did some tears, and I just kind of did some like physical therapy, yeah. <laughs> like making Are myself you winking close. At me? I see you winking. I see oh, him. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, um, yeah, but I mean that. That I have seen. Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't bad though. No, but no. those things are to be expected, especially even with like facelift surgery. You know, you've pumped a bunch of fluid and you've moved the whole face around. The muscles get a little bit stunned, a little bit swollen. Your face isn't going to work exactly right for the first one or two weeks, which is what I tell people: don't book the new family photos for five months. 
Like, give it some time to settle. It does yeah, take time. It does take time. I mean, you'll look fine after two to three weeks, but still, like, it, it's not totally right because it's surgery. And this isn't like getting a new haircut. It's not like, you know, going to the tailor and getting a new suit and doing a little adjustment. It is moving your face around and, and it's big time stuff. And you got to really pick people that know what they're doing and get great results. I couldn't agree more. And I think we've just done our pre-op for Midface. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> no need to read all that paperwork. That's just, right. Listen to the podcast. <laughs> Since we just can't stand the pre-op stuff. No, the pre-op stuff is important. We're there. So yeah, listen to the podcast. <laughs> You'll be well informed. And with that, I think we've kind of hit it all. Yes? Yes. Well, then this is the Beverly Hills Plastic Surgery Podcast coming to you from the 90210. Welcome to the... What are we, wait, wait, which one is this? I was doing it. We're doing, we're doing I was, I was almost going to do the, the ho- I was going to do the hockey one and talk to you about playoffs, <laughs> but I figured that'd be a very short conversation. Yeah. I'm going to start over. <laughs> Welcome to the Beverly Hills Plastic Surgery Podcast.